Hello everyone and welcome back to recitation. Hopefully you all are still doing well after a week. Uh, thank you all for filling out the recitation feedback form that I sent out sometime last week. Got a lot of really useful feedback from it. A lot of you guys seem to really like how I did recitation last week, running it out of my room with the little piece of paper. Um, so that's how I think we're going to keep doing it from now on until something else changes. So we'll go with that. Uh, I'm flattered by everyone that thinks I'm using a dot cam. I'm using a webcam attached to a selfie stick on a plastic bin leaning against a TV table uh, with a desk lamp pointing at it. So it's a little bit of a jank setup, but it works. Uh, with that said, we will continue and start with recitation, I believe. So I've got a lot of stuff to cover today. So. It might, we might not get through it all, or things might go a little faster than uh, people might like, but I'll still do my best to give you guys plenty of time to write stuff down, or just take pictures at the very least of what I have on the page. Uh, if you weren't here last week, I have most of the stuff pre-written, because my handwriting kind of sucks. So you guys will have that stuff, I'll give you guys time to write it down if I can, but there's a lot more to go over this week than there was last week. So. Let's get started with our usual announcements. Homework four, that's your BST current homework. Uh, that's gonna be due, or sorry, homework. Uh, yeah, that's right. Homework four, your current homework BSTs, that's due on the 21st. Uh, I don't have it written here, but homework three, your deck homework, that's due tonight. So if you don't have that turned in, make sure you get that turned in soon, otherwise it'll go very badly. Uh, but BST homework, that's due on the 21st. That is two weeks from yesterday, so you've got plenty of time on that. But I do recommend you start it soon. Uh, after this recitation, you should be relatively good to get most of it done, or at least get the hard parts done. Homework 5 is your next homework, just a little bit of looking ahead for that. That's going to release on the 18th and be due on the 25th. So that is a pretty considerable overlap with homework 4. We recommend that you try to have homework 4 done by around the 18th so that you have your full week for homework 5. We just have the deadline going past that uh, in case that you want the extra time on it. Exam 1 is next week. That's your very first exam. That's the 16th. It's on a Wednesday like all the exams are going to be. You have to use honor lock for that. Hopefully you guys have all set that up with homework zero. Otherwise, you're probably going to run into an issue on the day of the exam. Uh, but I believe pretty much everyone's done homework zero at this point. Uh, I think the assignments actually still might still be open if you haven't done it. After you take the exam and finish your honor lock session, that's when you're going to upload your scratch paper. So you will close the honor lock session, take pictures of stuff, send it to your computer, open up the scratch paper assignment, which is a separate assignment, not honor lock enabled, submit your scratch paper images, and that'll be good. Uh, even if you didn't actually write anything on your scratch paper, just submit the blank ones, it's fine. The ex uh, window to take the exam is 6 a.m. to 11.59 p.m. on the actual day of the exam. Uh, so it's an 18 hour window, you can start whenever you want, but you should make sure that you start before 11 p.m. at least, because it will cut you off at the 11.59 window, even if you're still in the middle of taking the exam. So definitely start right before, right the end at the end of the window. Uh, the reason it's not like a full 24 hours or anything is because we have to kind of be available to respond to questions and stuff while you guys are taking the exam in case like a technical issue comes up. Uh, obviously, we're not going to answer any like content questions if you ask us about like, oh, what does this what does a BST stand for? Like, what does the order property mean? We're not going to answer content questions. But if you have technical issues, definitely send those to your professor. Uh, and we just can't be available to respond to technical issues from midnight to 6 a.m. for the like five people that take the exam then. So we have this 18 hour window. This should accommodate you in whatever time zone you're in. You should have a reasonable time to take the exam. If nothing else, your lecture time that you kind of legally are available for. Uh, I see someone asking how long you have for the exam. They are designed to take 50 minutes, but I believe you'll have 60 minutes once you open them uh, to account for some extra difficulty with taking an online exam, but they are all designed to be completable within 50 minutes. Uh, your normal stuff, you've got a recitation worksheet that's on your regular canvas. Uh, that feedback survey I mentioned earlier, I'm still going to be looking at that. It's still open. Uh, that's on the recitation canvas linked in an announcement. Also, if you liked that card trick I did last week, uh, the link to the tutorial for that is at the end of that survey, so if nothing else you can fill it out for that. Also I want to point out something that's on Piazza. It is a something we call the Snow Citation. It's a recorded recitation we did a couple of years ago. Uh, there's a link to that on the 
7, that's the resources post on Piazza, it is going to be uh, similar to this recitation in a lot of ways, because it was kind of this one that replaced it. Uh, but it is very useful. I also see someone asked, how would we ask questions during the test because of honor lock? Um, it w you wouldn't be able to ask like content questions. It's a matter of if you have like technical issues during the exam, as soon as you possibly can, you should email the professor with any of those issues so that we can be aware of stuff that happened. Format of the exam is going to be really similar to the practice exam. All right, let's go ahead and get started today. And from this point forward, I'm going to be letting my fellow TAs that are here with me uh, help to answer most of the Q&A questions because I'm going to be teaching and making sure my stuff shows up all right. So thank you to everyone that's helping me today. So this week we are going to continue talking about trees and specifically talking about binary trees. And at that a lot of you guys are probably really confused. Jacob, what do you mean continuing to talk about trees? I'm very certain we talked about decks last week. I remember you showed off your entire collection of playing card decks. We definitely didn't talk about trees, and that's partially true. Uh, but what I actually mean is that we've been talking about trees for quite a while now, because when we talked about linked lists, those were actually examples of trees. They were really basic examples, but examples nonetheless. So today we're going to kind of expand our definition of what a tree is, and talk about a different application in a, our first non-linear data structure. So trees are just ADTs that have nodes, and those nodes have references to what we call child nodes. And when I say references here, it's just like how a doubly linked list node has a reference to a next node and a reference to a previous node. These tree nodes have just a reference to children nodes. So they might have two references to two child nodes, they might have like an array of references to a bunch of children, something like that. But they have a data and they have the, um, uh, sorry, they have the data and they have the children nodes. So just like a doubly linked list has data, next and previous, etc. Uh, trees are very recursive by nature. So what that means is if you take a tree and look at like one of its children, and all the nodes below that child. That in itself is another tree. We sometimes call it a subtree. So every time you kind of take one step in a tree, you're kind of dealing with an entire separate tree that's just a little bit smaller. So a lot of recursive methods are gonna work very well on trees, and especially with binary search trees. Just like you saw that we had some nice recursive methods we could write for linked lists. Binary trees are a subset of trees. The only difference is that we restrict that every node can only have at most two children. So trees inherently can have as many children as they want, but binary trees, as the name suggests, means we have to have zero children, one child, or two children. Obviously negative children isn't a thing. You can't have negative children. So this would be an example of a binary tree because this node has two children, this node has one child, and these two nodes have no children. So every node has less than or equal to two children. Some main properties of nodes that we might talk about is depth and height. What depth means is it is the number of edges it would take you to get from the root to any specific node. So the root has depth zero because you don't have to go anywhere. Then those nodes one away from the root would have depth one. That's these two nodes have depth one because they're one edge away from the root. Then this node over here is depth 2, because there's this edge right here and this edge right here. So if you start from the root, you have to go two edges to get to this node. So it has depth 2. Height is in a lot of ways kind of like the opposite of depth. Uh, it is the number of edges from some node to its deepest descendant. So with that definition, that kind of means that these leaf nodes all have uh, height 0, because you don't need to go anywhere to get to their deepest descendant. This node would have height 1 because it's one edge away from its deepest descendant, and this node would have height 2. You'll notice it's one edge away from this descendant, but it is two edges away from this one. This is the deeper one. So here the root has height 2. One of the ways that you can calculate the height of a node is you can look at all of your children's height, take the maximum of all of those, and add 1, and that gives you the height of your current node. And you'll notice that's a very recursive formula. If you wanted to write this in your code, which you'll have to, you're just going to be looking at the max of your left height and the max, or sorry, the max of your left height and right height, and add 1, and that's the height of your current node. 
Also, as a note with this definition, it kind of means that the height of a like null node is going to be negative 1. That's because our leaves have height 0. So if we consider that it, that would be the height of our children plus 1, that means that this null spot has negative 1 height, this null spot has negative 1 height. So negative 1 plus 1 is 0, which gives us our uh, leaf node height. Another really interesting fact that a lot of people find really helpful is that the depth of the deepest node in our tree is equivalent or is equal to the height of the root, which is also the height of the tree. So this one is like a math equality. This is just kind of like a name definition of equality. We call the height of the tree the height of the root. Those are the same thing. Um, but if you look here, the root had height 2 in that description I gave earlier. This is our deepest node, and that has height 2, or that has a depth 2. Inversely, uh, the root has depth 0, and our deepest node has height 0, because it's always going to be a leaf node. So I'll give you a couple more seconds to write that down, then we'll start talking about shape qualities for trees. I see another unanswered question. Uh, I think we're planning on posting the practice exam answers. Uh, I'm not positive about that, but I believe we are. Uh, I will let you know after. You will probably see an announcement tonight or tomorrow after we have, uh, when we release the topic list for the exam. All right, that should be more than enough time for you guys. Again, you can always rewind and pause on specific frames if you need to see things again. So I'm not going to like be going back to previous pages often because you have the ability to rewind live. Let's talk about shape qualities. So trees can have kind of two main types of qualities. There is shape and order. We're going to talk about shape first, and then we'll talk about order when we get to binary search trees specifically. So there's really... Uh, three main properties that we talk about with shape and kind of this fourth extra one that's there along too. Balance is the first one that we talk about here, although it is one of the last ones we're actually going to talk about in this class. What balance means is that we our height is roughly log n, kind of O of log n. The strict definition is the second one, that the sibling heights don't differ by more than one. That's like the technical definition. This is more of a consequence. Don't worry too much about this definition right now. Once we talk about uh, AVLs, which is a different data structure later, we'll talk about height in a lot more detail and it will probably make a lot more sense. So don't stress too much over this definition or trying to determine like whether a tree is balanced or not. We'll get to that later. Full is another quality we're gonna talk about. If a tree is full, that means that every node either has no children or it has the maximum possible number of children for that node. Those are our two options. So with a binary tree, that means every node has zero or two children. There's no one child cases. Uh, with other trees we'll talk about in this class, that can be a little different. But for binary trees, that means nodes have zero or two children. Note that full trees are not necessarily balanced trees. I'll show examples of that later. Our third property is complete. Complete trees mean that every level of the tree is completely full, except possibly the last level, which is filled in from left to right with no gaps. Let me add that with no gaps, because that is an important caveat. Uh, I, I say this maybe because if the last level is completely filled, that is still a complete tree. Uh, but generally, sometimes we don't say the maybe, just out of convention because the last level being filled completely from left to right still fits this definition. Uh, as a note, complete trees are always balanced. You can try this out for yourself and see that if you don't have those gaps in there and every level is always filled, it's impossible for you to have an unbalanced tree. The final one we talk about, and this one's less of a shape property and more of like a classification, is degenerate trees. Degenerate trees are basically like linked lists. Most nodes only have one child. Your height is roughly O of n. It's pretty much just a linked list. It doesn't necessarily need to like all go in the same direction. So you could have like a binary tree like that, and that would still be considered a degenerate tree. Now, degenerate trees, people get really hung up on this. It's not really a super strict definition like, oh, if you follow these exact qualities, it's a degenerate tree. Otherwise, it's a not degenerate tree. Uh, it's kind of what I've called in the past like a spectrum of degeneracy. So this tree is very degenerate, uh, 
even if it has two children on this last node, that's still basically a degenerate tree. It's not maybe as degenerate as something that's just a complete linked list, but you still get the point. It's not really a hard and fast definition. Now, none of these aren't really things we're going to like test you on, like giving you trees being like, is it a complete tree? Is it a degenerate tree? It'll be like using these definitions in context as we talk about our different data structures. Now, granted, I'm about to do an example of classifying a tree into its properties, but that's more just to help you kind of understand and learn them. It's not like something we would ask on a test. All right, a couple more seconds if you guys want to take a picture or write down some last things. Again, we have to go a little bit faster this week compared to last week just because we're talking about a lot more stuff. All right, so let's look at some examples of trees and try to figure out what shapes they are. So I'll give you guys a second if you want to take a picture of this blank page before I start. Uh, you'll notice I started abbreviating after the first one for what our different properties are simply because it, writing all of them down all the time would have been not great. Uh, I'm about to get to like what the gap means for complete trees. People ask that, someone just asked it actually, but uh, a TA will probably answer it well too. So let's start with this first tree. Is it balanced? Well, if we look at our nodes, we can see that there's nothing like super swayed to one side or the other. We can see that here we have a child with height 0 and a child with height negative 1. Here we have a child with height 0 and a child with height 1. So nothing's too far off. The tree is still relatively balanced. Now is this tree full? Well, in the binary tree, remember, full means that we don't have any one-child cases. And right here, this is a one-child case. This node does not have the maximum number of children. So it is not full. Is it complete? For complete, we look level by level. This top level is completely filled. This middle level is completely filled. It's this level, we got two nodes on it. Then this bottom level, we can see it is not filled in from left to right. If it was, there would be a node here, a node here, so the two children of this node, and another child of this node. And that would be what I mean by filled from left to right. So this tree is not complete. Is it degenerate? I wouldn't say so, because it is a balanced tree, it doesn't have that many nodes in it, but it's not kind of all in one direction. So this is basically not degenerate. Let's look at this node over here. Is this a balanced tree? Well, it's basically the same as this tree over here. We have this extra node over here, so this node is a little more balanced than this node, uh, but the roots are equally balanced, and again, we would consider this a balanced tree. Don't worry too much about the definition of balance. Don't feel like you need to be able to tell whether trees are balanced or not. Until we talk about AVLs, this is kind of just an extra thing we'll mention to keep in the back of your mind. It's not that important. Now, is this tree full? Well, we can look at the nodes. Two children, two children, and then zero children, zero children, and zero children. So every node is either zero or two children, and that is our condition for being a full binary tree. Is it complete? Again, we look at this bottom level, and we see that there's these gaps over here on the left side of the level, so that means our tree is not going to be complete. And again, it's not going to be generate either in this case. We'll move on to here. This is just the mirror image of this tree, so it's still going to be balanced because it's the same thing on the other side. It's also still going to be full. You can look at all the nodes. Is this complete? Well, this level is full. This level is completely filled. Then this level, we have a node on the leftmost, then a node after it. So this is going to be a complete tree, because this bottom level, even though it's not completely filled in, starts on the left and doesn't have gaps in it. Now let's go down here. This is going to be a balanced tree. Again, it's just the flipped of this top one. It's not going to be full, because we have a one-child node here. But it is going to be complete, because this bottom level starts filling in from the left. So these are both complete for the same reason, and these are both not full for the same reasons. And this tree over here, this one's not a balanced tree. If we look, it has kind of two extra layers on this left side. So the height of this node is 1, and the height of this null spot over here would be negative 1. So we would not consider this balanced. Likewise, it's not full. These two nodes both have one children. It's not complete because this middle level here is missing a node right here where it there should be one, so it's not full, not complete, not balanced. We would consider this a degenerate tree, because it's basically a linked list. In fact, it literally is a linked list, because everything goes in one direction. Uh, so this would be like a degenerate tree. 
Now over here, this is kind of an extra example I wrote up as an example of a tree that is not balanced, but is full. You'll notice every node has zero or two children. Uh, it is not complete because this third level is missing nodes on the left. Note that's not the bottom level this time, it's just the third level, it just happens that nodes on the left are missing. So it's not complete, not degenerate, not balanced, but it is full. I'll give you guys a second to take pictures of these if you want your answers for later, and then we'll move on and start talking about binary search trees. Now let's finally move on to the topic of your homework, binary search trees. So just like uh, trees are a subset of binary trees, sorry, binary trees are a subset of trees, binary search trees are subsets of binary trees. So generally we're just going to abbreviate them at this point as a BST for binary search tree, uh, obviously just to save space, same thing. So a binary search tree is a binary tree that's been given an order property. Now what an order property is, is that's just a relationship between either our two sibling nodes, or well, in a binary tree our two sibling nodes, but in general all of our sibling nodes, or it's some relationship between the children node and the parent node. In this case, what our order property for a BST says that all of the data to, a left, to the left of a node is less than it, all of the data to the right of a node is greater than it, and in this class it means that we don't have any duplicates, so there's no case where you have data that's equal. These can both be written as strict inequalities. So I've kind of have an example down here. You can see all of the data to the left of 25 is less than it, all of the data to the right of 25 is greater than it, and again, since trees are recursive, that follows. If we look at just 18 as its own tree, all of the data to the left of 18 is smaller than it, and all of the data to the right of 18 is greater than it. So all of these trees are very recursive in nature. Now in order for us to have any sort of meaning for data being less than other data, or vice versa, we have to have all of our data implementing the comparable interface. So comparable is in java.lang, java.lang.comparable. Uh, you'll notice iterable, iterable was also in comparable. Uh, java.lang versus iterator was in java.util. We'll see a similar analogy much later in the course, but that's kind of a parallel you can draw for being both in java.lang. And what the comparable interface means is that our data implements this compareTo method. CompareTo is a method that returns an integer, which lets you know the relationship between two pieces of data. As a note, when you use it, you should use it as comparisons to zero. So we should have x dot compare to y, we should be looking if that's greater than zero, or less than zero, or exactly equal to zero. It is important that you're not trying to check if it's like exactly equal to one or exactly equal to negative one. This is the wrong way to do it, this is the correct way to do it. Please look in your homework PDF, we have details on what the actual return values mean and how you use it. In general, you should always be looking at your homework PDF, there's always a bunch of useful stuff in there for people to see. Uh, in this case, we have details about the comparable interface and how you use it. So I don't have like all the examples written out on here. Again, give you a couple more seconds, and then we'll start talking about how BST operations work. All right, BST operations. So the first one we're gonna talk about is doing searching in a BST. This is in a very important operation, which is kind of unsurprising considering that this S right here stands for search. So we would expect searching to be an important operation. How we're going to do it is we're going to start at the root of our tree. So we have a root. I don't know if I mentioned that for certain earlier, but trees have a root just the same way that linked lists have a head. It's our one way into the tree, so if we ever want to start anywhere, we have to start at the root. But our search is going to start at the root, and then we're going to move downward to one of the children at any given step. 
So the point is that we're not going to go to both children. There's never going to be a reason to check out both children in a search operation. We're always going to be only looking one way. So how do we tell which direction we go? Well, we do this with a comparison. We compare the data, which is the target data that we're searching for in the tree, with the data in the current node. And if our data is less than the current's data, then we make a recursive call to the left side. Because remember, everything to the left of a node is less than it. If our data is bigger than the data in our current node, we're going to make a recursive call to the right side. Exact opposite reasons. And if our data is exactly equal to the current data we're looking for, that means we found what we're looking for, obviously. And if we ever reach a point where current is null, then that means the data is not in the BST at all because we reached a node said our data was for instance less than it we looked at all of the data less than that node which would be to the left and we found there was nothing so if we ever hit null in this procedure that means the data we're looking for was not in the bst now you'll notice i've used kind of the less than greater than and double equal symbols but in your homework you should use the dot compare to method and the dot equals method the only time in here where you should not be using dot equals was this current equals null. That you should use the double equals, but for this one, you should be using the dot equals method, not the double equals method. Uh, so now let's look at adding to the BST. So searching is obviously important because we have a binary search tree, but adding is important because we have a data structure and we want to add elements to it. If we can't add items to our data structure, it's kind of a useless data structure. So when we add things to our BST, when we add things to any tree-based data structure, we need to make sure we maintain the shape and order property. Now maintaining the shape property is very easy. We're never going to add something that causes us to have three children or any weird thing like that. It just wouldn't be possible. So we really need to focus on maintaining the order property. That's going to be the tricky one. Now in order to maintain the order property, the easiest way for us to do that is to make sure we're just adding it leaves. If we add somewhere in the middle of our tree, we have like weird stuff going on, we don't really know what's below it, so we're just going to always add at the leaves. And when I say add at the leaves, I mean we're going to create a new node that is a leaf node. So we create nodes that have no children. How we do this? is first we search for the data. Now I have search in quotations here. It's going to be very similar of a traversal to what you have up here. I just didn't want to write everything again, where if our data we're trying to add is less than the current node's data, we go left. If it's greater than it, we go right. But the couple differences with adding is if we find the data that we're trying to add, that means it's a duplicate. The data we're trying to add was already in the tree. So in this class, we won't have duplicates in our BSTs, so this means you should just not add anything. And if we hit null, searching that means that the data wasn't there, which is a good thing in a binary search tree for trying to add, and this means that we found the new spot for us to add our new element as a leaf. And that makes a lot of sense, because if we were going to actually search for that element, the null spot where we are right here in this operation is where we would have found it. So that's kind of where we're adding it. And you'll see this when we do some examples, which I will do on the next page, but I'll give you guys a couple seconds to write stuff down, because this stuff's a little important. All right, hopefully you guys have gotten stuff down or at least paused and taken a screenshot of everything so that you can look at it later. But now let's go ahead and move on to examples. And if you want to follow along with these examples I'm about to do, feel free to pull up the visualization tool and try these out uh, with binary search trees. It should be the exact same results, but I'm going to do them on paper because it's a little easier for me to draw the things with my current setup. So I've written down the elements we're going to add in the order we're going to add them. So let's go ahead and get started. The first thing I'm going to do is add 50. Right now I've got no tree right now. So adding a element to it just means that it's going to become the root of my tree. Now let's add 75. So remember my add procedure is I start with a search operation. So I start at the root. I say is 75 bigger than my data or smaller than it? 75 is bigger than 50. So I go to the right. 
and I hit null. This spot over here, no elements here, this is a null spot. And since I've hit null, this means that this is the spot that I should add my new 75. And you'll see if I was going to search for 75 now, I would start at the root, go right by one, and find it just where I added it. So now let's add 100 as our new thing. So when we add 100, we start at the root. 100 is bigger than 50, so we go to the right. 100 is bigger than 75, so we go to the right again. We hit null, and null means that we found the spot to add our element. Now let's do 15. We start at the root, we go left by 1, because 15 is less than 50, so we go left. We find a null spot, which means that this is the spot where we should add our element. I'll go a little faster. 5, we start here. 5 is less than 50, we go left. 5 is less than 15, we go left. We find a null spot, we add our element. Now 10. 10 is less than 50, we go left. 10 is less than 15, we go left. 10 is greater than 5, so we go right. And we hit a null spot where we add 10 as a new leaf. Now finally we do 25, less than 50, greater than 15, and we found a null spot to add our new element. So this is the resulting tree that you would get after you do all of these operations starting with a blank tree. And give people a couple seconds to finish writing that down or to take a picture of it, but hopefully most people got that as I was writing or wanted to do it on themselves later and just check back with my results. Uh, someone just asked for the constructor that uses the collection, can we use the add method? You can and should use the add method. That constructor should be very short and calling your add method. All right. Now let's talk about possibly one of the most important things we're going to talk about today, and that is pointer reinforcement. So pointer reinforcement is very crucial for this homework, and it is very important for uh, future homework that we're going to talk about. The glare is a little bad, but I think you guys can still see most of the stuff over here. This says cur.write. Uh, which can be a little hard to tell. That's cur.left and cur.right. So pointer reinforcement is something that we honestly don't really expect you guys to understand perfectly the very first time you see it. It is a little weird. It is kind of uh, non-intuitive, but it is very effective at what it does and very effective at making concise code. I highly recommend, after you see this, you look at some other resources, like you look at the Sai Krishna slides that we have on Canvas, you watch the Snow Citation video that we have linked on Piazza, look at other sources of pointer reinforcement, and try to just digest the information again. As another note, this is kind of a name and technique that we made up ourselves, so if you Google pointer reinforcement, you're probably only going to find 1332 resources or random unrelated stuff, so it might not be the most useful thing. Uh, I know some places this is also called like pointer reset or something, uh, but in general this is kind of a name that we made up, so I wouldn't expect to see it in other places. So first when I mention pointer reinforcement I should talk about like what the alternative is. So what is not pointer reinforcement? I will stress that this is not a recommended method, but it is something that is called look ahead, or that we call look ahead. The reason we call it look ahead is it's when you're at some given node, you're kind of looking at the nodes that are one edge ahead of where you are. So looking at like the left child, looking at the right child, trying to check if those pointers are null before you make a recursive call. So you could kind of see it as like look before you leap. You're looking if you're about to step into null before you actually do. And this can definitely work for BSTs, but it gets a little messier, it has a lot more edge cases, uh, it's going to make some other homeworks a lot harder, so it's really not the way we recommend doing it. TAs recommend pointer reinforcement instead, because look ahead is going to have a lot of if conditions, you'll have a lot of edge cases, you're more likely to make mistakes with look ahead, even if it is a more intuitive method of coding. We really recommend that you try to use pointer reinforcement, even if it's a little bit of a struggle at first. What it actually is, it is a add and remove technique for 
uh, BSTs, uh, you can use like pointer reinforcement style code for stuff like uh, get or contains, but it's really only important for methods that actually change the tree. Uh, so I call it an add remove technique here. The TAs highly recommend this. Every single TA you talk to will recommend doing pointer reinforcement on this homework and recommend doing pointer reinforcement on the later homework where it's applicable. It is important. Please do it. Pointer reinforcement will cover pretty much all your edge cases very easily. You People tend to get worried because they feel like they haven't written any edge cases because pointer reinforcement just kind of covers all of them. And if you use pointer reinforcement, once you get to the AVL homework, that's homework seven, uh, you'll be able to practically copy and paste your code for BSTs and everything will work fine. If you don't use pointer reinforcement on this homework, you will have to basically rewrite homework seven from scratch. And that is considered generally the hardest homework in this class if you have to write it from scratch again. The base kind of characteristic of pointer reinforcement is that when we make recursive calls, we set the child that we're recursing towards equal to the result of the call. So remember that when we talked about search, we talked about like recursing to the right child or recursing to the left child. In this case, that means we're going to have something that like a cur dot right equals our add helper on cur dot right, something like that. So the important thing is this result is getting set equal to some child value. Again, this is a little bit of a weird stuff. It'll make a little more sense once you've seen it though, I think. The point is that each of these recursive calls is returning the root of a new subtree, specifically the subtree that you're trying to operate on. So all of our recursive calls that we write with pointer reinforcement return a node as the return type. When we're doing adding with pointer reinforcement specifically, these are kind of the things that we have to change. It means that when we hit null, we return a newly created node. So instead of actually like uh, setting some pointer explicitly equal to a new node, we just create a new node and return it. Otherwise, in the case that we're not hitting a new null, a uh, null spot, we're going to just return the node we're currently at after we make our recursive call. And remember, when we make our recursive call, that gets set equal to our child value. Leave this on screen for a couple seconds for you guys to write this down. I know there's some text heavy pages today, but hopefully the information is very useful to you on homework four. All right. Let's go ahead and move on. And let's look at an example. Let's have the same tree we worked with earlier. So this is kind of the tree right before we did the very last add. So we're about to add 25 to it. And let's see what happens. So the very important step of pointer reinforcement and probably the most often forgotten step is what we tend to call reinforcing the root. And what that means is our first step is going to be root is going to be equal to our add helper, which I'm going to abbreviate as add h on, so this is the node we're currently operating on, so I'm going to denote it as the 50 node, and then this is the data we're trying to add. And what that means is root is just going to get set equal to whatever this method returns. So we don't know what that is yet. It's impossible for us to know until we get there. But right now we're at this node, and we say, okay, which direction should I recurse to? Well, because 25 is less than 50, this means that what we're going to be doing is a recursive call to the left, so a recursive call on the 15 node. And because it's pointer reinforcement, what that means is I'm going to be taking the 50 node, and I'm going to be calling dot uh, left or dot set left on your homework, but I want to save more space here, and that's going to get equal to our recursive call on specifically the left child of 50. So 50 dot left with our data. So notice that 50 dot left here is the 15 node, but I'm writing it as 50 dot left so that you understand that 
that's kind of how you would write it on your homework. Is cur dot left equals add helper cur dot left twenty five. This being the data you're trying to add. And again, we don't know what this value is going to become, but we'll find out later. Now, our next recursive call is we're going to have fifteen. And here we note that 25 is bigger than 15, so we recurse to the right. So we're going to have 15.right is going to get set equal to our add helper of 15.right and the data we're adding, 25. You'll notice that these tend to match up exactly, so we have 50.left here and 50.left here, 15.right here, 15.right here. Uh, these are both the root, so 15 and this 50 node are both the root. That is very purposeful. Those will almost always match up in pointer reinforcement code, and on like your homework for add and remove, those should always match up, I believe. So, we make this recursive call. Now what happens? We're at null. And what did I say to do once we hit null? Well, when we hit null, this is when we return our newly created node. So we return a new node with 25 in it. And that return value goes up to here. So what does this line of code say? It says set 15's right pointer to the result of this call, which we just said is 25. So 15's right pointer is now 25. Now what does this method return? Again, if you remember from what I wrote on the other page, after we make a recursive call on just a regular node, we return whatever node we were currently at. So this is going to return 15, our current node, back up to the previous call. And what returning the current node does is it basically indicates, okay, this node didn't change. This is kind of just unraveling the recursive stack. Nothing changed here. It's all of the places that we didn't touch in our operation. So 50's left pointer is going to get set equal to 15. Cool. That's what it was beforehand. We just set the pointer again. We reinforced the pointer connecting 50 and 15. And just like last time, this method is going to return uh, back, or this call is going to return back to this method, the node we were currently operating on, which is 50. And this says that root equals 50. So we've reinforced the root. This step is very important. We have reinforced the root back to the same value it was. Now, in uh, BSTs, it really seems like we're doing a lot of extra uh, writing here, even though most of the stuff isn't changing, and a lot of these things are just setting values equal to themselves. And that's partially true. But the big thing is that once we get onto AVLs and stuff, things might be moving around a lot while we're unraveling the recursive stack. And so having this structure in place is going to make things a lot easier. Plus, this code ends up being relatively clean, even uh, if it's not very intuitive. Again, we don't expect that you guys are going to understand this perfectly the first time you see it. It's going to take you a couple times of looking at it. That's okay. That's expected. It's a little weird. Check out the Sai Krishna slides. Check out the Snow Citation video linked on Piazza. Lots of other places. There's also some pseudocode in both of those places uh, for add and remove methods. That pseudocode is incredibly useful to you on your homework. So definitely check it out. Let's see if I can fix this again. It's literally just held in position by scotch tape, so not perfect. But hopefully you guys have had time to write all this down or get a picture. I'm going to go ahead and move on, and let's talk about the other operation for a BST that's important, which is removing. My camera is a little out of frame, but I think this has everything on screen. Uh, if a TA could let me know if there's something that I can't see, but I believe that's all good. So how do we remove from a BST? Well, the general algorithm is going to start very similarly to how we did for other things. Our first step is going to be to find the node. 
just like in search and add, we follow that basic search traversal algorithm going left and right to look for the node that we're trying to remove. What we do from there is going to be kind of a case by case basis. Does the node we're trying to remove have no children? Does it have one child or does it have two children? If the node has one, has zero children, then the parent should just point to null. So for example, we should go from, if we're trying to remove uh, the second node right here, it should just go from this two child case to kind of this single parent pointing to null. I know you guys can't really see that, but hopefully you at least get the idea that when we remove this bottom node, because it doesn't have any children, its parent just points to null afterwards. This is a null pointer over here. If we have a one child case, so that would be like A pointing to B pointing to C, and we're trying to remove B, then our parent should just point to that single child of B. So it just kind of shifts upward, uh, nothing gets rearranged or anything. There might be more things below C that doesn't matter. Two children is the weird one, and that's the main one we're going to be talking about uh, during today's recitation. In a two children case, we're going to have to replace our node's data with what we call the predecessor or successor. Uh, you'll notice uh, the successor is the one on your homework. So that's the one I'm mostly going to talk about today, but they are basically the same thing. And then you remove that node which you use to replace the data. Now, a lot of people always ask, okay, how do you determine whether to use the predecessor or successor? Uh, this is kind of our first instance of an implementation detail where to the user, it doesn't matter whether you pick predecessor or successor. You could do either. They both work exactly the same and they both work just fine. But for the sake of the homework, we ask you to specifically use the successor because that's what allows us to grade your code and know exactly how things should perform. But which one you choose doesn't really matter that much in the long run. Now, what are these strange words that I've used? The successor is the smallest value after the value we're trying to remove, or just after any given value, if we don't care about removing. So what that means is, if the data we have are in order, the successor of a piece of data would just be the data that follows immediately afterwards. So that's kind of one way of thinking about it. Another way to find it in kind of a BST style is we go right a single time, that gives us data that are greater than the current node, then we go left as much as possible without hitting null, and that will reach our successor. If you think about that, that, excuse me, uh, that will get us to the data that is greater than it, and going left as much as possible will get us the lowest piece of data, the smallest data in that subtree which is exactly what we're looking for. Now I mentioned we have to remove the node we used up here. So when we remove the successor or the predecessor, but in this case, the successor, removing the predecessor is going to always be a zero or a one child case. And that's because if it had an extra left child, then we wouldn't have gone left as much as possible. So we can go a step further to continue finding the successor. So once we actually hit the successor or the predecessor, that's always a zero or one child case to remove it. As a note, something for your homework, you shouldn't use the remove method to get rid of the predecessor or successor. That would be inefficient because that's going to traverse the entire tree again to find it or that entire branch at the very least. Uh, if you're using pointer reinforcement, <laughs> we're recommending it. If you use pointer reinforcement, this will be very easy to actually do the removal with pointer reinforcement. You'll see it kind of follows very naturally with how you do the regular removals. And just as a kind of parallel, the predecessor is just the largest piece of data that is smaller than the data we're trying to remove. Uh, the, you can just kind of flip all of the words here from left to right and vice versa, and that would end up with the exact same thing. Bit of an example here with this tree. The successor of 12 is 14. You can see we could go right once and then all the way left. The successor of 20 is 25. Again, it's the node right after it. And the predecessor of 20 is 18. You could see it's the data that comes right before 20. Or in code, you could go left once, then all the way right to find it. So just some examples uh, that you could try on your own, looking at trees, figuring out whether data was predecessors or successors.
but on your homework you should be using the successor node to remove. Give you guys a couple more seconds to take a picture of this or write this down, and then we'll start talking about how we actually implement removals using pointer reinforcement and a little extra something that we call a dummy node. Okay, let's talk about implementation. So when we're implementing removals using pointer reinforcement, straighten this out a bit. When we're implementing a removal using pointer reinforcement, a lot of it's going to be very similar to add, because that's also a pointer reinforcement method. The important thing is that once we find the node that we're trying to delete, we should either return null in the zero child case, or we should return kind of the correct node that you're trying to point to depending on the case. So if it's in a one child case, you should return that one child. Uh, if it's in a two child case, you're going to end up returning your current node. Uh, I see someone said, could I explain the last two statements on my predecessor successor? Uh, those statements were to not use the remove method when removing the predecessor or successor. You'll see an example of that later. And the second thing was just saying use pointer reinforcement. So I think that's like the fifth time I've said that today on paper, use pointer reinforcement. So I mentioned a dummy node on the previous page. So what is a dummy node? Well, you'll notice that there's actually kind of an issue here. When we're using pointer reinforcement, we want all of our helper methods to return nodes. Specifically, we want it to return nodes that the parents should point to. And in that structure, there's no way for us to return the actual data we're trying to remove, which is kind of unfortunate because our remove method should return that data that we found in the tree. So how do we accomplish this? We create an empty node in our public remove method. So we don't make this in the helper. We make it in kind of the public wrapper method. We pass this empty node as a parameter into the recursive helper. And therefore, it's going to get passed into every single recursive helper beyond it, just as an extra parameter. So our add method kind of had a, uh, we took in our current node as a parameter. We took in the data as our parameter. Remove is going to take those two in plus a third parameter for the dummy node. Once we've found the data we're trying to remove, we're going to do a line that looks like this. We have dummy.setData. This is our target node. It's probably not going to be called target in your code, but the node we're looking for, that node's data is going to get set to the dummy node. Then once all the recursive methods are done and returning, they'll go back to the public method. And once the public method has access to the dummy node, because it's the method that created it, and it can just return dummy.gets. Uh, dummy dot get data because it's going to have been set in a lower recursive call, which is imp and then that is going to persist all the way through the recursive stack back to our public method. The reason it persists is because we use this node as a container to hold the data. If we didn't use the node as a parameter, if we just tried to do like a t data parameter, that would not work because that when we tried to set it in our helper method, we would only be overwriting our local variable copy because Java kind of uses pass by value for most things or at least close enough to it. Uh, and overwriting that local copy would not work. So we have to create a node to use as our dummy. Another thing is that when we're removing the successor, we're going to need to create a second dummy node. So just like we do with our public main remove method, removing the successor is going to involve creating a second dummy node. So I'll give you guys a couple more seconds to take a picture or write this down. And then we're going to take a look at what uh, removal with pointer reinforcement looks like on an example.
All right. So our example is going to be the exact same tree we used earlier. So if you've got that written down somewhere, uh, you can just continue using it. I have a new one written for this example. And we're going to do removal with pointer reinforcement on this tree and figure out what's going on. So as I mentioned before, we have to have a dummy node for this to work. So when we start this remove 15 process, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create this dummy node over here. So I'm going to name it dummy. If you want to give it a little bit of a nicer name, like uh, node goblet or something, uh, feel free. We see all kinds of clever and funny names on your guys' homeworks when you submit, but lots of stuff. You can use whatever you want. Dummy is just kind of the standard. So just like we did for our add method, our first recursive call is going to need to reinforce the root. That means we're going to have root equals, I'm going to just uh, abbreviate this as remove h. Now we pass in the root here, which is 50 in this case, the data we're trying to remove, and our dummy node. These are our three parameters of our remove helper. So what that means is now this pointer is kind of gone. It hasn't been set yet. It's looking for what it should be set to. And I'm going to kind of illustrate that a little bit more in this example than I did with the add example. But that stuff's not actually really any different. Then we get to this 50 node. We see that in this case, uh, 15 is less than 50. So we're going to recurse to the left, which means that we're going to have 50.left is going to be our remove helper called on 50.left. Again, we want these to match up. The data we're trying to remove and our dummy node. Exact same dummy node here, exact same dummy node as here. Now we do our data comparison again. In this case, we see that uh, 15 is exactly equal to 15. Again, on your homework, remember that these are dot compare to and dot equals methods. So we now we look, how many children does 15 have? So we could say that this is a two child case. It is a two child case because 15 has a left child of five and a right child of 25. Oh, sorry, uh, this pointer is kind of up in the air also because we when we made this call on 50.left. So now, how we do this is we're going to use the successor. And I mentioned that you should use pointer reinforcement with the successor too. Again, if you want to see kind of pseudocode of what these methods look like, feel free to uh, look on the Snow Citation video, or I think even the Sai Krishna slides have good pseudocode. Uh, there might be even some more somewhere else on Canvas. But I'm just going to be kind of describing what goes on. So when we do the successor, we're also using pointer reinforcement. So successor moves to the right by one. So 15.right equals, uh, let's just call it remove successor on 15.right. And I mentioned that we were going to need a second dummy node here. So let's go ahead and create that. So we create our second dummy node and pass that into the helper method. As a step, we could have filled in this first dummy node as soon as we found 15. That's our target data. Uh, you can do that before trying to remove the successor or afterward. It doesn't really make a difference, but it's a lot easier to put that line at the start. This is because we found the data we're looking for. So when we do this, this means that we're making a step to the right, and we reach this 25. So now we check, is 25 the successor? Now the check for that says, OK, if it has a left child, then we should continue going to the left. Otherwise, we're at the successor. So we know that 25 is the successor of 15, because we went one step to the right, and we couldn't go anywhere to the left. There's no pointer here. So now we need to do two things since we found the successor. The first thing we need to do is we need to populate our second dummy node with the data value from the successor. The second thing we need to do 
is we need to uh, let's write out explicitly what's going on. So this is this is inside this call. We don't have a left child, so we populate the dummy node, and then we are going to remove 25. Now remember I said that when we remove a one child or zero child case, we just kind of need to return what the parent should point to. And in this case, when you're removing the successor, the thing you can always do is just return the right child, because that's either going to be null in the zero child case, or the right child in the one child case should be return 25.right. Now that is null. And what returning null does is remember, this is going to go up to here. It says that 15.right should point to null, which is going to remove 25 from this list, or from this uh, tree, sorry. Now, we're back up here in our 15 recursive call. The important thing is we've populated our dummy node. Now, for our two-child case, we have to replace the data in this node with the data from the successor. We know the data from the successor is the data in our second dummy node. So let's do that. We're going to replace this 15 with 25. And now that we've done that, we need to just return 25, which is now our current node. Remember, our, what our current node was didn't change. Only the data in that current node changed. So we are going to return the same node containing 25 back up to this method. And this says 50's left pointer should be set equal to this node that's containing 25. So this pointer didn't actually change. Even though the data it was pointing to did change, the pointer itself stayed the exact same. And again, just like we did in the add method, for nodes like this where nothing went on in the 50, all we need to do is return that current node we're at. So this is going to return 50. And this says that the root should get set equal to 50 which is exactly what it was before. So now with pointer reinforcement and then uh, our public remove method would return this data in the dummy node back to the user and everything would be done. Now that is a completely done remove method using pointer reinforcement. It's going to be a little weird. I recommend looking at a couple other sources of stuff, stuff in the Sai Krishna slides, the Snow Citation video, uh, where we'll do some stuff in lecture. There's probably some stuff in the course videos. Look at it in other places. Try to do examples of it. It will make more sense after you've done it a little bit. So I recommend that you try to start on it a little early so you're not trying to do this last minute. But really, try to do this homework using pointer reinforcement, even if it's a little bit harder. You will thank yourself later. Trust me. I'll give you guys a couple more seconds to write stuff down, and then we'll move on to some of the efficiency stuff regarding BSTs. All right, so let's talk about efficiency. Our three main operations that we're going to talk about with BSTs, uh, lots of questions just got answered as soon as I moved that, but I think the TAs are going to be able to answer all those, so I'll just start talking about efficiency. Our three main operations that we talked about with a BST are add, remove, and search. But height is also kind of an important thing for BSTs, is determining what the height of a BST is. So let's talk about all of these in turn. First, let's talk about these main three, since they're all basically the same. Remember that add and remove basically start with do a search to find the node. Uh, and then once you find that node, then you're going to do your operations on it. So 
if we are looking in the average case, on average, BSTs will usually be mostly balanced. They might not be exactly balanced, things aren't going to necessarily be perfect with them, but they'll be close enough to balanced. And in the balanced case, what's going to happen is kind of what I've drawn, drawn down here. Every time we take a step to the left or right, we're cutting off ruffle, roughly half the data in our tree. So if we start at this node and go right, the data over here was roughly half of the data in the entire tree. Then if we go left again or something, I think I said uh, right instead of left. If we go left here, uh, then this is like a quarter of the data we're cutting off, which basically means that if we want to take, if we are requiring us to take another step in our tree, that happening means we had to double the data in the entire tree just in order to force us to take one more step. And that relationship, uh, doubling the data in order to take one more step, is an indication that we're dealing with a log n complexity. And this is in the average case, also in the best case, because in the best case we have a perfectly balanced tree. Note, best case refers to the kind of property of the tree, not the kind of data we're searching for. So a lot of people think best case is O of 1 because, like, just search for the root that's O of 1 time. But no, best case means what could the data structure look like for our oper for any kind of uh, input to give us the best case time. And that's going to be not any different in this average case. So that's going to be log n. A lot of people always ask, okay, what's the base of the log? Here it's pretty clear that I'm talking about log base 2 because it's a binary tree. But in computer science for big O notation, or just in big O notation in general, uh, remember that constant factors don't matter. And if you remember back from like pre-calculus or something, the change of base formula for logarithms, uh, all logarithms are a constant factor away from different bases. So like uh, log base 2 of n is only a factor of like log base 2 of 10 away from log base 10 of n, or something like that. It's not a big difference which one you use. The worst case, remember, this is what's going to happen when we have a degenerate tree. So if we have a BST that looks like this, then adding and removing and searching and stuff, that could potentially take O of n time, because we might have to go through every single node in the list to find things. So all of these operations can potentially be very slow. And we'll talk about ways how to mitigate that later in this course when we start talking about uh, balanced trees like AVLs. Now what about height? If you remember all the way back from like one of the first pages I had here, height is a recursive definition that has to look at both of the children. We have to look at the height of the left subtree and the height of the right subtree, take the bigger one and add one. But to calculate both of those height values, we have to look at all of the nodes below them. And this is kind of a thing of there's no way for us to know in advance uh, which of our two children is going to have greater height without actually calculating the height first. So height is going to require us to go all the way down to the base of the tree, reach our leaves or null spots, which are our base case, and then recursively unravel and go back up to the root. So no matter what kind of tree we have, height is always going to involve touching every single node in the tree, which is going to be an O of n case, because we have n nodes in the tree. So I will give you guys another minute or so to write that down, uh, answer, ask any questions you want so the TAs can answer them, and then because we finished with a couple minutes left, uh, and you guys seemed to like them so much last week, I do have a card trick prepared for you guys that hopefully will go well and hopefully you guys will enjoy.
All right. Uh, doesn't seem that uh, there's too many questions. I see one question at last minute. Uh, because we had a recitation on the very first week of class, which is not normal, normally we do not have recitation on that first week, recitation has gotten to the point where it can get a little bit ahead of lecture. So some of the stuff I talked about today, we actually are going to talk about like Wednesday or Friday in the class, but it just got a little bit ahead of it. Um, and that's just kind of how it worked out. We're making use of the time we have because this recitation and this information is kind of important for you guys to start on your homework. So we figured it was more valuable to just get the information to you now so that you can start on your homework, even if you'll kind of have seen it in recitation before lecture, if you're only following along with the live lectures. But regardless, let's pull up this to make sure everything's in frame, and let's hope this card trick goes well. So uh, I will warn you, I basically pack practiced this trick like once last week, so if it goes poorly, that's my fault. But I've got our deck of cards here, and we're going to do a trick with them. Now this trick only actually is going to require us to use four cards, the four through ace of hearts specifically. So let's go ahead and get those out of our deck. Ace, okay, so there's the two, and there's our three. And there's our four. So I am going to need them in order. Ace, two, three, and four of hearts. So we've got these values right here. Oop. Sorry, I need to keep them in order. Otherwise, uh, things are going to go very poorly. So ace, two, three, and four of hearts. These are the four cards that we're going to be working with for this trick. And the basic idea is I'm going to be taking these cards and I'm going to be flipping them over one by one just by doing a simple turn of the card. And just like that, that's going to turn over the ace. So now we just have the two, the four, that's the ace turned over, and the three right here. So next I want to turn over the two, so I'll give the cards a little rotation, and that will flip the two over and the ace back up. So now we have the three, we have got the ace, we've got the two face down right there, and the four. Next up is going to be the three. So again, we just give the cards a turn, and now we have the four, the two, that's the three face down, and the ace right here. And finally we need to do the four, so we turn the cards. Now we have the ace. We've got the three, that's the four right there, and finally the two. Oops, sorry, drop the card. So, now all these cards I've shown to you, but all their backs, have turned into blue. And while I'm at it, what the heck, I'll go ahead and change the entire deck. And that was today's card trick, and that's going to be the end of this recitation. If you want to look that trick up, it is called the Revolver Trick, I believe. Uh, I don't remember the exact name of the YouTuber who uploaded it, but you can find the trick on YouTube. I will probably link it somewhere if I remember to at a later point, or if I send out another announcement about it. Uh, hopefully you've enjoyed recitation. I'll give it a little bit longer just to catch up to the live point, and then I'm going to go ahead and end the event in the stream. Thank you guys for showing up.